Let us begin. What Welcome to Elders Rising. This is episode 24. Um, we've got Koi here with us today. And first off, I guess, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, I'm Koi. Originally grew up, grew up in Idaho. Came down to Logan. Uh, still living here. So that's about it. I mean, see, I love engineering. I love, let's see, controls, 3D printing. I don't know. About any cool adventure or new toy is kind of fun to play with. But. Cool, cool, cool. Um, today, one of the things that I was thinking of talking about was, um, and, and I mentioned this to you already, but um, is the role of faith. Um, it's kind of a, it, it really has a far uh, bigger role in living freely than than i would have expected like as i as i dig into it in, in my own thoughts in my own personal thoughts um and i don't know i feel like it's one of those subjects where you could you know if you're going to do a half hour segment you could do like nine of them and still only get halfway done so it's we'll see you know we'll cut this off at some point in time but <laughs> it's kind of funny how um the there was a my, my brother-in-law, or not my brother-in-law, my brother was telling me about um, and getting into religious topics, and usually we focused on the Constitution, and that's why I'm like, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the right right way to go into this because it's so, because uh, it's um, less on the Constitution today. But um, getting into, my brother was telling me about how he was in this meeting with a general authority, and um, it was, I think it was in the MTC or something like that, and he some kid they, they sometimes they'll open up the the meeting so you can ask any questions and this kid some kid goes up and he asks uh, a missionary goes up and he asks one of these general authorities he's like in revelations this and this this says this and this says this like what are the meanings of this and this and and he gets into some really deep heavy stuff which is not bad mm -hmm. but the general authority looks at him he's like honestly i've been trying my whole life to figure out faith I might suggest you do the same you know and it's just like it's it, it's kind of a it's kind of a bittersweet uh concept but the, th the thing that com comes to my mind though is how I, I i've really liked there was the book by cleon skousen called um saving the constitution i think it was something something to do with the constitution um but i read it recently and it talked about how uh the ability to be free is contingent on two different things it's contingent on the ability to, or our, our instinct, and I've talked about this a little bit, but I don't think I've gone into it very much, but our instinct and the things that keep us as human beings um, on the planet. We have instincts that make us want to um, be safe and have food. We have instincts that want make us want to have shelter. We have sexual instincts that help propagate the race. We have um, these, these core instincts that keep the, the, the humans alive. And they're, they're very important and they're good, um, but when they're unchecked, run rampant, they become very bad. Um, they lead to like tyranny and they lead to slavery. They lead to, um, to dominating others or to, if, if, um, if you have too much of them or you don't have enough of them, then you really get into these weird bad things happen. And the other side of that is you have morals. You have things that, that you believe are morally correct as a society. Um, we, we do it individually, but as a society, we have these morals, and the morals are what put a limit on that instinct. And when we as a group have these, 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 these two things in common, th there's this natural tension between our instinct and our morals, but we as, we as humans, we, we 
come together and, and that's how our societies are created. Um, we, we have a group, we, we, uh, we all agree that certain things are correct and th certain things are wrong, but our, and, and those things limit our instincts. And um, the, the, the place that faith gets in there though, is like the, our society has been built off of the Bible, off of, um, the, off of the morals that are taught through Christianity. And that is when we only, we only care about those things, we only care about those morals when we have some base level of faith in what, what those morals are, are, why they're there, and what they're doing, you know? And so it's like without a core base level of faith, the morals are just good ideas. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. That's, to me, it was, it was surprising how that, that faith really is part of the thing that makes those morals meaningful. Yeah, I can see that. I don't know, it's kind of interesting because I never read the books. I've never really looked through what he said and how he said that or the context that he applies it. But it seems like with each um, civilization that comes through, it really, you make these rules that allow everybody to succeed. And when you get somebody's avarice or greed or you know, a uh, sexual desire override that, you see the destruction of that civilization. Mm -hmm. um, from a different context, uh, one of my favorite history series is written by uh, William and Ariel Durant. Mm -hmm. And they basically go through each history and or each civilization they could. He spent about 40 years putting together this series. 40 years? 40 years, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. So he started off with like East Asian studies and he got up to like Rousseau and the French Revolution. And then he died. So, and apparently nobody's taken it up. But in the last, after he'd finished his 10th or 12th volume, I forget what the last number was, they had this, uh, like a three hour recording where they sat down and talked to him about, you know, what did he learn? And uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me the most is he was a professed atheist. But he had mentioned, you know, when I originally started this series, I really believe that, you know, religion was just kind of this hux that we put on people to control them and ruin their lives and it basically it wasn't a positive thing and he said you know as I've gone through and studied this I've seen that even if religion is completely worthless what I have seen is it's helped curve these instincts of these you know the need for power or the desire for power or sexual fulfillment or these other things I've seen it how these even if I think that religion is completely garbage it's allowed people to curve their early instincts to build greater things and greater civilizations and uh he'd say you know he even said at the end that he would he would say you know <laughs> if he ran into himself earlier he'd actually apologize for you know putting that on people or you know assuming that of them and the worthlessness of religion <laughs> and it's, i found that really telling for somebody who had been a professed atheist for so long just to point out that there's, you know, even if you don't believe in the religion, that he still saw that there was immense value in having these systems that would help check people's natural tendencies to over overextend themselves and, you know, control or allow themselves to be controlled by others. It kind of thinks, it makes me think of like the, you know, you think this is, this is uh, turning it into like day-to-day -day business concepts. But you think of like marketing. A lot of times marketing is geared towards the least common denominator. They, you don't want to have in your marketing um, complex sentence structures because that's difficult for people to understand if they're not familiar with complex sentence. And so you want to make sure that it can hit them, you, you, can, you can reach the most people possible. Um, in, a, in a practical sense, religion does that as well. It, it brings people from all different... Um, uh, backings or, or education levels or life, life views and it kind of puts them in a similar focus and direction and that's, that's, that's going in purely into like the practicality aspect of it mm -hmm. um, but I can see how that's so important in a society because with societies it's like we um, we can do really good things as individuals Doing really good things with groups of people is harder to do because you have to have shared goals. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to get people all on the same page. And then I, I'm talking like, okay, 
your 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 single project you can you can do so good and 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 nail it and just crush the the task or assignment or whatever it is the thing that you're trying to get done if it's all on you you can do you can just do awesome if you have a group of 10 a team that you're you're just a part of then it's like well this guy thinks we should do it this way and this guy thinks we should do it this way and this guy thinks we shouldn't do it at all and you know and it's like it's it's it becomes much harder to get everybody on the same page and to get a, a group of 10 people to do something that's very very um like stellar that's amazing you're you're much um it's much harder but when it happens you can do so much more like you can when when a team is firing on all cylinders it's just like it's magic yeah and then you take that and extrapolate it to a city or a, a state or a country like the whole country it's like it's it's i think it grows exponentially difficult to get everybody on the same page but also the benefit is probably exponentially the potential is i, I don't know there's i'm sure there's there's it's it's not as as, as simple as that but you know, you know what I'm saying. The the, the multiplication yeah. of, of the, the efforts really makes a big difference. Well, I think it's an incredibly bonding experience, too, because, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people that have been out of high school for 20-plus years, but they can still remember this one game or this one, this one event or, you know, a lot of people go back to their missions because, you know, you were united in this purpose and you had this, you know, the not only teamwork of two people, but you might have had six or eight or even 12, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredibly powerful but very memorable event. Yeah. That's interesting, the bonding part of it, that I hadn't thought of. But I, I hadn't deliberately thought of because that's it really is true, though. Because that's like those relationships that mean the most to you are the ones that you've been through hard things with and you keep and you kept going and you got through it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like the the stressors, whether that's a task to do or something that you a, a united focus or whatever... The stressors are the things that really, like, weld you together. And I guess you can get to, you can get onto the, the, even in, like, welding and, like, different, um, different aspects of, like, how things come together, materials come together, is, like, usually you put it a stressor, you put it through a furnace, or, you, you know, you do mm -hmm. something that causes it to get out of its current state and helps it become in a, in a better or newer state. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as faith goes, though, one of the things that when I was when I was growing up, I remember asking myself and, and really spending time thinking about this question of like the, the idea of if if God wants me to know something, why can't he just tell me? You know, it sure would be convenient. It would be so much easier. <laughs> why? Why do we have to have faith? And why do we, and and I've spent a lot of time thinking about that because it's it's something that's like intuitively that's that's the most efficient way to do it just have god tell us you know and if he just told us then we wouldn't have to question we wouldn't have to worry we wouldn't have to wonder there would no be no um second guessing yourself there'd be no uh uh you know it's it's it's, it's really interesting and the the thing that i don't know i guess before i tell my thoughts on it what what do you think when, when you ask when i ask you that question why why doesn't god just tell us everything because he doesn't use apple products I mean, I think, you know... <laughs> Tell me, what do you mean he doesn't use Apple products? Tell me this, what are you talking I've never seen that in the book of Revelations, but you know, there's a lot of chapters, so I might have missed something, or maybe it's in deep in Deuteronomy, but, <laughs> you know, um, I think it's it's important to learn to grow, you know, and I there's always that primary answer where it's like, you know, yeah, he could tell you, but then what's what's the effect? And it's one thing to know it analytically in your head, and it's one thing to really experience it, but... One thing that's really surprised me as I've been raising my kids is, yeah, it's, it's often it's a lot easier for me to just like do things than it is to have my kids do them. Um, but I think it's a lot more <laughs> rewarding because, you know, if I can wait the time, uh, it was, it's definitely better um, for them to do it just because it, it helps build them. You know, I can quickly mow the lawn and I mean, right now I could probably do it in five minutes because I have a lawn that's the size of a tabletop. But, you know, what I've, what I've actually done is actually sold my motorized mower and got a little real mower, um, one that, you know, I feel safe actually letting my four or five-year-old push it around the lawn. 
And I've seen that as um, he's been engaged in this, that he's become more independent, but more industrious and in learning that like, if I put forth effort, I can make things look really nice. And he's gotten so excited about it that he now mows like the front lawn where, you know, the HOA is supposed to mow. So now we have this like beautiful golf, golf course lawn because my five-year-old just thinks it's so much fun. But I mean, it's nice for the looks, but the real point is I'm not trying to mow the lawn to get it done. I have to step back and say, you know, I'm really, I'm really doing this to build my son, you know, to help him learn that his energy can make something better. Um, and usually when I used to keep track of the time, it was usually about 150%. Uh, if it took me an hour to do something, it would take me at least two, one and a half, two hours to do something with my kids to do it for the sole purpose of building them up. And I kind of, I feel like that really carries for um, the Lord in my life is, you know, he's just on this other plane of just a higher plane, but um, helping me to become the best person I can be, but becoming more than I am now is stepping back and saying, you know, yeah, it sure would be easier for me to do this, but I need you to learn and become so that you can carry on by yourself. That is so profound. The, the, the thing, the thing that caught my attention as you're saying that is like, your son, he, he grew to love it. Like he grew to like, it, 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 the drive that it, it brought, like I'm, I'm thinking of a kid, that I, I, I don't remember, I've, I've met your son, but I don't know him very well. Um, but I'm just thinking of just, there's, there's not always a natural desire to like, oh, let's go out and work, you know, that's, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's not very common. And that, that does happen. Some kids do just love it, you know, and that's fine. Um, and maybe your kid's like that, but um, but it's also like it when you can actually do something for yourself, it empowers you. It empowers you, and that's that's like what you you're seeing that in your son. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, but but then when you when you reflect that back onto us and God. It's it fits. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. It makes so much sense. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's definitely an age group that really excels with that, you know. And I really feel like four to six year olds love that. But you know, I found my older son loves it too in different ways, like with eggs. You know, he loves eating eggs. Well, eggs that he makes. But you know, I've had to go through for about a year where, you know, he cracks the egg and half of it falls on like the heater coil and it's like now you've got burnt egg in the house and you're like "Ooh, is the fire alarm going to go off what's what's going to happen you know or oh you want grated cheese you know and we you know we've actually had to look up strategies like all right how does that culinary institute of america work it, oh you have everything ready before you turn the pan on you know and like yeah pro tip that's a really great idea with kids um but you know now it's like it's not so much a fight for breakfast because it's not like here's the yogurt because I'm too tired to, or, you know, don't want to make anything for you. Uh -huh. He now has the choice, like, you can go make eggs now because you, you have put in that time to learn that. You are now skilled to choose your own, I don't know, breakfast destiny, I guess. And it's like, it's like, he's no longer, you're not the bottleneck for his breakfast. Yeah. It's like, I'm just going to go make some breakfast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and last week was actually the first week that I was, I actually didn't think about it until I got done with it. Uh, usually I'll hang out in the kitchen and watch him because, you know, if fire breaks out or something, I want to be <laughs> close. But I actually ended up, like, taking a shower and realizing, oh, yeah, if a fire would have happened, I don't know if he would have got me. He probably would have put it out himself or something. Maybe, you know, it would have smoked up the house and I would have found out later. But, yeah, I was completely out of the room and he did it all by himself. And he was really proud of it, you know. And I think that's a big part of life is just growing that self-autonomy. He's, he's six? Yeah, seven. So, seven? Yeah. That's nuts. That's awesome. Well, not yeah. nuts, but it's awesome. Yeah. He's, he, he's trying to take it out to Snickerdoodles now. He wants to learn how to make cookies. And we're like, oh, we don't want to be rocking the boat too fast. <laughs> you know, healthy food only, you know. <laughs> but it has been nice because when you put that effort into something, he's more committed to eating his food. So, I mean, both point. my kids are less picky now that they've made their own food. <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, thank you for sharing that. Um, one of the things that it made me think of, though, is, like, I, I thought of the example of, like, when your kid is, like, uh, you've got one kid that you don't want to let, let them cook anything on the stove, right? Mm -hmm. The younger kid, and he's just like, no, you can't, don't touch that. You know, there's the, there's the firm, no, don't do that. And another kid is, um, 
completely fine doing that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, go ahead and do that. And um, whether God, like the, the thinking of like, why doesn't God just give us the answers all the time? It's like really similar to what you were saying though. It's like building that autonomy. I, I, I view the, the role of this life is not to get the right answer. That's, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, when we think of like religion and think of like commandments and think of like, even with like the morals that we ha- have, the morals that we have are, are the baseline of what we're trying to strive for. That's the very, the baseline. But the morals are just like the starting point. What we're trying to do is become autonomous, become autonomous individuals that are entities, that are eternal. We're mm-hmm. trying to learn how to make good choices. And that's the, that's the purpose of, of this whole life for us, is trying to, to grow that autonomy. And in, in the same frame of that, one of the things that, one of the, the big benefits that I see is, um, has to do with God's ability to be merciful for us, or to us. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that uh, God being perfectly just, if he gives us a perfect knowledge of something and says, hey, don't do that because it's bad, and then he lets us go and do that, because we knew perfectly that that was bad, it has to be bad, like, and, and we we feel the the effects of that bad, the the consequences of those. Um, the more fully we understand that, the more f- severe those consequences are. Um, just like with a kid that is accidentally playing with the stove and lights a house on fire, that's bad, but it's not the same as a teenager who sneaks in and causes a fire at their neighbor's house. Like that's that's arson, and mm-hmm. one is an accident. And one is like, no, that person's going to jail, and as they should, you know. And mm-hmm. it's, um, it, to me, th- faith is one of those things that really lets God be merciful to us. He, he, he doesn't want to give us the stuff that we're not committed to do yet. He doesn't want to give us the stuff that we're not ready to handle. And so, um, so that, th- growing with that autonomy, it really it really makes sense that it's a process that it's a i mean it's a process that we we won't accomplish we won't finish by the end of our life because how do you learn everything i don't i don't know you know one day at a time (laughs) one day at a time line (laughs) upon line yeah Yeah. that's i mean the the whole iterative approach that's that's i think it's an internal uh principle um but it's like for me it's like faith is so um it's 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 a good question on like why can't we just know the answers but because we don't know the answers it lets us try and lets us try and I had this experience in, in college when I was um, I had a professor who he was, he was teaching us about um, parallel programming he's teaching us a class on parallel programming and it turned into an AI class where we just did some AI, like we that was kind of one of the we, we did some pet projects where we wrote like a neural network from scratch and we did like um, just different genetic algorithms and stuff like that and it was really cool and this guy, he was, he told us, he's like, the rest of your work life, when you get jobs and are in careers, you're going to be told to go do this and, and you're going to have like a focus and you can't just explore. He's like, I want you to try something hard that's going to push you, that's, that's probably outside your ability to do and fail. Because um, you're in college. Now's the perfect time to just mess up. Do something way crazy harder than you could and, and fail at it. And for our final project, me and another guy, we tried to create what's called a liquid state machine, where it's basically, so it's, it's the type of um, artificial intelligence that was used. This guy created a, um, a li- liquid state machine that he fed in um, Mozart, like all of Mozart's works, um, to this, 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 this um, algorithm. He fed it in th- to this algorithm, this, this liquid state machine. It's like basically got a neural network, then, an, then a self-organizing map or a self-organizing network, and then a neural network out and stuff like that. And it's, 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 it's complex, very complex. But um, after he did that, he got the, the neural network to create Mozart's music, to actually generate new music that wasn't ever created, that was the style that Mozart created it from. And it was distinct from Bach, and it was distinct from Beethoven. It was Mozart's music, and so that's the type of stuff that, like, that's the type of thing that um, I was tr- we were trying to make, and we failed utterly. 
like we didn't even know how to like get started basically but i learned so like i i spent so much time reading into this and i was just like it was so cool but it was also like i failed at it i'm and and i don't regret it you know if i didn't have that his his prompting if we were just trying to go and get the task done we ended up not even turning in that like the project we turned in a uh particle generator that was parallel processed that was um that the other kid had done in a different class because we didn't have anything to turn in and he's like that's fine and he, and he gave us fine grades on it you know because he's like he didn't care about the the actual product that we produced he cared about us growing through that process and i loved that and and i don't know it's just it, it I, I guess tying back to faith though like faith gives us the ability to not necessarily know exactly where we're supposed to go but just try and just try and do things and if we get it wrong we learn as we go and you know I, I don't know that's 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 kind of one of the things that I think of as a big benefit of of why faith is so important to this life yeah no I think it's it's a lot about growth it's it's hard because <laughs> Yeah, I keep thinking back about that general authority. It was just like, I'm still working on these baseline answers. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because I feel like faith is one of those things where you, you know, like, yeah, on paper, this is how it works, but it's a whole different ball game to be okay with it, you know, or to be <laughs> yeah. confident in it, you know, oh, like, man. I'm still working That's on how so bad true. things happen to good people, you know? Yeah. And to be, I mean, it's, it's a simple concept, but it's not, it's a whole different ball game to see somebody suffer and be like, it's okay, you know? Or unjust, you know, especially unjust suffering. Yeah, especially people who are just trying to do good and be good and be punished for it or be, like you said, unjustly um, suffer. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, it seems like every person's different, but the Lord gives tailored specific things for them. Because I remember, you know, when we first, when I first got married with uh, Katie, my wife, we were looking for an apartment complex and there was this little studio apartment that was fully furnished and we thought it'd be great. It was like 500 a month or something. I want to say it, it was actually like 300. So as a newly married person that had zero marketable skills <laughs> and you know, minimum wage was the only reason why I got paid more than 50 cents an hour. Um, <laughs> well, that's debatable, but uh, you know, it was, it was hard because I thought about it and I was like, well, I'll pray about it. And, came back no don't like it was like a flat don't go there you know and it was like these apartments are in the nice part of town like it's a safe area you know um in fact i was actually led to go to these other apartments it was like a one room bedroom so it was it was like two or three hundred dollars extra a month which you know at the time i thought was a crazy amount of money mm -hmm. you know and i mean for somebody who just was starting out it was like an extra week's worth of work for you know each month just to make ends meet and uh I was really caught off guard or really doubting that question. You know, why, why was I sent to these ones? You know, or why did I, you know, and he hasn't really told me all the time where I should live, but it was very distinct when I was starting out and probably because I'm an extremely frugal person. So it probably would take like an act of God to get me to spend more than $200 for <laughs> a different apartment. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but in hindsight, as I've, you know, gone through it, I've gotten the answers to that, and that's helped me understand greater things. You know, I was led to some really good people that, you know, we actually ended up rebuilding a car engine using YouTube, but it shifted a lot of things in my mind, realizing that what I thought was capable, what I was capable of, or with, in partnership with other people, I was actually far greater capable. And so, really, in hindsight, the money wasn't a bad thing. It was really to get you know, I think I was put over there or sent over there to run into these people and actually have my, my perspective, like major perspectives shifted just because of my associations with them, you know, and um, that's really helped me in other times where I get answers that I wasn't expecting or, um, you know, they weren't exactly quite what I thought was the best thing on paper. I've always gone back to previous experience, the smaller experience of, that I've had earlier, that it's kind of built for greater leaps of faith as that goes on. I don't know. Because that, I mean, the apartment's worked out, and now I can, because of that, I have faith that this other answer I'm getting is even more important or, you know, will turn out similar. I feel like the Lord does that for everybody, you know, and that mm -hmm. makes them an extremely busy person. The thing that, and playing a little bit of devil's advocate there, here is the thing that makes it weird though is like you can you can take things like that 
and you can be like, oh, you're taking the good from this situation, but what about those times where you thought you were doing the right thing and bad things happen, you know? And what about, like, there's, there's, there's legitimate, um, there's legitimate arguments for, like, you know, you're, you're choosing to believe that something was good without knowing the other side, or without knowing, you know, and that's, I, I think that that's a, it's, it's one of the things that, that choose at our faith, that choose it like, okay, you know, c- because there's no right answer on that. There's yeah. no, there's no right way to, to, to respond to that. And I don't know, the, the thing that I was thinking of is like, it's, it's sometimes, um, really does depend on us looking at what we want to see. Like, I, I guess it, was, it makes me think of like, I don't know, the meme or, I, I can't think of a specific meme right now, but I, I know I've seen certain memes where it's like, you have two people and one person's looking at like, the, the rainbow that's coming from the, that's out of the storm and stuff, and the other person's looking at how the storm just blew over their cabbages, or I don't know, like, mm-hmm. the, depending on what we look at, that's what we get, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, you, 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 there, there's, there's an argument for like, oh, well that's just your optimism, you know? Mm-hmm. What do you what do you say to that? Could be. I mean, you know, I I feel at some point you can write off. I feel like there's only so much you can write off. At, you know, the saying, well, that's just coincidence or that's rose-colored glasses. Because I have seen people that have optimistically written off terrible things. You know, and it will be interesting. It would be really nice if you could just see every, you know, every loose end that would have came from you know whatever choice because maybe you know for that apartment thing maybe i would have found other people or saved tons of money so i could have paid somebody to actually rebuild my car for me you know or, <laughs> you know i don't know um yeah i don't know to that i mean yeah there's i'm a fairly optimistic person so that's that's a true thing you know and i think part of that comes from just being in believing in god i mean at that point you know I guess because of that, I literally believe that death is a temporary thing, that, you know, there's more to that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> I love, my son loves Chronicles of Narnia. And so there's one part where in the silver chair, it's like the second or third to last book, um, they meet the bad queen, and there's this bad queen, and they found this, this, this prince was kidnapped when he was a kid. They meet this bad queen, and she kind of tells him, you know, she starts using her magic to put him to sleep and telling him that, you know, oh, this beautiful world of Narnia doesn't exist. It's just down here with these tunnels that I live in, you know. And uh, if you ever read The Silver Chair, it makes sense. But there's a part where uh, one character named Puddle Glum, he's like a marsh wiggle. I, I don't even know what that is. Probably like a badger. But a C.S. Lewis copyright protected badger. I don't know. But um, he puts his foot in the fire and he says, uh, and it kind of wakes him up and snaps him out of it. And he says, you know, even if Narnia doesn't exist and you know, all there is to life are these awful tunnels that are just where everybody's miserable. It doesn't sound like you've built this really great world. Like I would rather, I would rather go on and have hope in something better. Um, and I kind of think that kind of holds true because Narnia is really, or the Chronicles of Narnia, I think was a really good metaphor for Christianity in this world. Cause there's a lot of awful things that happen. And I think it kind of, Christianity in general gives us this hope that there's a better, like, even if we're in a terrible situation, you know, you can still have that perspective for the eternities. It's funny, um, as I was reading, I, I read, um, I read partly into the Gulag Archipelago. Um, I read the first, uh, there's three, I don't, I don't know if they're called tomes or books or whatever, and I read most way through the first one. And it, um, they're long. Like, I, I listened to it, and I think I got it on Audible, and they're like 80 hours each, you know. And it's it's heavy. It's sad. It really is sad. But um, it basically talks about these um, guys who... So the, the story that it follows is a guy who, um, I think he's the author of it, he was a part of the police um, in Russia, and he ended up... Um, be, he, one of his friends was in the, one the on the front lines, and where he was stationed at, he ended up getting uh, was cross this communication line. They had a line where if you weren't allowed to have contact with anybody outside of this geographical, uh, like past this geographical position, and he kept in contact with his friend, and 
it wasn't like a it wasn't like a big rule. He kept in contact for like a, like two years, but their their section of the police was low on their was not meeting their quota for how many people they're supposed to bring in to go to jail, mm-hmm. and so he got turned in by one of his buddies because of this com- communication, and so he ended up going through the same stuff that he put people through type of a thing, and um, he he told it, he told it how him going through this. Like, he told it from both sides because he had been through both sides. And what they would do is they would get these people, they would round them up and throw them into this gulag, um, this jail. Um, first thing they would do is, a lot of times, they would put them in, like, eight inches of water. And they'd make them live in, in a cell that had eight inches to a foot of water in the bottom of it at all, all times. And they could never get dry. They could never, you know, it was just, it was just uh, their feet would, like, start to rot. Um, they'd start starving them. They'd start like, and they'd, and then they, 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 uh, they'd starving through starvation was one of the, I think that was one of the um, biggest ways. Most people, once they were starved enough, like two weeks or something like that, I don't remember. But um, once they're starved to a certain point, then once th- once someone's broken down enough, then they would get them and they would um, get them to confess of a crime that gave the people the justification for doing to them what they had done. It proactively gave them that justification. So it's like, until they'd confessed, they weren't supposed to be doing that. But once they confessed, it was okay. And so they just had to break them down until they confessed. And the people that these guys that run the gulag, the people that they were scared of, he mentions these old ladies, that um, th- these Christian old ladies that were like, I didn't do that. No, you can't do anything to me. Kill me, that's fine. And like they were just stubborn and they would never confess. And if they were audited at a time when they had one of those old ladies in them, they would get thrown in the, the, the gulag themselves, the, the people running it, because it was against the law what they were doing. But they also had, it was against the law, but everything was against the law. And it, like th- I've said it before, the way that you control a population is make everybody a criminal and then prosecute judiciously. You mm-hmm. prosecute based off of like your needs, political needs. Yeah. And that's, that's how you control population. And that's what was being done. And um, so if they were audited at a wrong time when one of these old ladies, bef- before they had actually gotten her killed or she had, they had been able to break them down and confess, they, they were the people that would scare these old ladies. And these old ladies knew it. Like when they would see what was going on, they'd be like, you're ashamed of yourself. You should be, you're like, you're an evil person. And, 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 and they would stand up to them and they would never confess. And because they never confessed, they would, um, they would basically have to torture them in a way that caused them to die of natural causes that was like oh well we were processing it and we didn't she, she, they died and stuff and they couldn't you know and it's just it, it was it was a bureaucratic nightmare but it was also a, on a human level it was a nightmare and the thing that gave those those old women the babe uh babushka i think is what he calls them or something like that i think that's the russian term for old woman grandmother grandmother or something like that yeah but um he um is is the, that 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 belief in more than just this life, that belief in more than just right here and right now, um, and that's something that I think most religions touch on. But I think specifically the Christianity and with Christ's resurrection, it's it's a powerful um, lesson. It's a powerful uh, it's a powerful um, perspective to have, and it's 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 one of those things where it's like. Whoa, how, how, how do you know that that's going to happen? It's like, that's a good question, you know? I feel it. I feel it's right. Um, I, I can tell you the, the experiences that I've had that I, that I can't deny, but I can't give those experiences to you. They're mine. Like, I've, I've received them, you know? And, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's like you said, with the, the boy in the, the, the silver chair. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'd rather live in a world where I'm, I'm striving and working towards that than a world where everything's not that. Where everything's uh, just in a tunnel where we're all just hidden. You know, I, I, the, I think that there, there's a famous name for the, this argument. In, Pascal's Wager? Yeah, Pascal's Wager. That's what it is. Thank mm-hmm. you. I knew it was from Pascal, but I couldn't remember what it was. Um, do you do you remember the the nuance of that? I don't remember the exact. I think it was like I'd rather live like there's a God and find out there wasn't one than to live like there wasn't a God and find out there was. Yeah, yeah. Pops up in that uh, 
Christopher Paulini series. What is that? Uh, the Aragorn? Yeah, the dragon books, yeah. I didn't know oh, that. Uh, yeah, he puts that in there. If you look at the dwarves, they're kind of the... They, they they have a little thing in like the second or third book on that one. I remember that because with the coral, where they were like, the, the elves were like, uh, stone can't grow, it's stone. Like, that's the stupidest thing ever. And then it was like, coral. And, and it was such an interesting nuance where it was like, um, that's a stone, like that's rock, but the rock came from life, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Suck it, elf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the snide elves. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. There's, always, there's always an exception, right? I don't know. I feel like, you know, with the people that I ran into, so with like, um, I served my mission in Taiwan, so I'd run into a lot of Buddhist and Taoist and somewhere in between. And it was kind of interesting because a part of Buddhism is we'd run into these monks occasionally that they would get to a point in their religion. And this is all for, through like, I basically had to learn Mandarin and talk to them. So if I totally slaughter this, it's, I just don't even understand. You know, it's really <laughs> like, there's a huge language barrier, but it appeared that they got to this point in their monk training or their monk being a monk where they were told to, you know, you don't eat meat. You don't, you don't inflict harm on other animals because you believe in reincarnation. And then there was a point where they would actually tell them, no, now you're going to eat meat so that you know what other people are like, you know, what the outside is. And I think there was something, it was something interesting that really surprised me because, you know, I had discussions with, you know, like, here's the Book of Mormon to a monk, you know, and it's like, how do you explain, you know, God is your loving Heavenly Father? And it's, it's an interesting conversation. And they're very, very kind, very uh, respectful people. I actually remi- really admired them because, you know, I feel like with Christians, there's different sects of Christians, and you run into one, and it's kind of like, by the way, you're going to burn in hell. You know, you're like, it's a turf war. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, well, thanks, you know, and Jesus loves you too. You know, or like, <laughs> this is great, you know, or vice versa, you know, because I, I know a lot of LDS people that kind of lose it too, and it's... Oh, it's, yeah. But the Buddhists were very interesting, because I would run into them, and even the very devout people, especially the devout, that's actually a really good way that I found that you could gauge them was how they treated others. But there were times where um, they would actually be like, you know, we don't believe in your religion, but we we see that you're trying to do good things. You know, here's a 7-Eleven Slurpee or something. And then it's like, well, that's cool, but, you know, you know, is it poisoned? You know, like, you know, because like growing up in Utah, Idaho, you kind of see, you know, you kind of see that because I'd get letters from another friend that was serving, you know, somewhere else. And he's like, by the way, we got jumped and mugged on the way home. And I got, I had a people, a guy chased me with a hatchet. I had people spit on me. I had. Yeah. And I, yeah. I drank Slurpees for free outside 7-Eleven. <laughs> so, I mean, we all have our struggles, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, you'd also run into atheists and it seemed like there was a couple of camps, but one of them were people that were generally looking but were afraid to get an answer. And then there were people that were afraid to look because they believed they'd get an answer. It was kind of like, how does uh, C.S. Lewis put it? Yeah, it was like, burglars don't look for cops the same way that normal people do because they don't want to find them. You know, or, you know, lawbreakers, you know, repeat lawbreakers. Or, you know, and I've kind of seen that too in my life. But I feel like for the people, I feel like in general, when people are sincerely going to give God a chance he he answers and not only that but he takes the time to answer in a unique signature to them in a unique way for them which makes it remarkable because I have two kids and trying to keep up with two is hard enough left alone you know an exponentially higher number one of the things that um there was some talk uh, I, I don't remember where I heard the story but it was a a uh, guy basically he had a fireside he was teaching this fireside and he asks and it was two adults and like it was a, an entire steak or something like that and he's like how do you know if someone is converted to christ like how do you know if they're converted to christ and he just sat there and for like an hour he just wrote on the board what people would answer he wrote it on the board what people would answer he wrote it on the board and and it was like it would be quiet and then someone would raise their hand and they'd give an answer and it was thoughtful and it'd write it down and it'd be quiet and it, it, over and over and then after like an hour or 45 minutes or some of this, he he stopped and he's like, thank you everybody for sharing this. And then he went and he erased the entire board. And he's like, those are all thoughtful answers, but they're not quite right. I don't remember exactly how he said it. He's like, the best way to tell if someone is truly converted to Christ is how they treat their fellow man. And I was just like, 
when I, when I look at people, regardless of whether whether they're like um, LDS or if they're like uh, Seventh Day Adventist or even 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 people that are not Christian, people that are um, not religious by any means, I think that there's something innate that Christ brings about when we treat each other as people good and well and and with kindness and with dignity those things are are the manifestation of our faith whether it's consciously towards Christ or not that's what that is that's what the whether you want to call it conscience or the light of Christ the that internal um, that internal compass that, that shows if we've accepted that, you know, mm-hmm. and I think that that's the I think that that's really um, that's one of the things that helps me that gives me hope for um, I'll, I don't know for, for for everything really. It's like um, there's there's in the there's a video with um, Joseph Smith and his father uh, the, the restoration video came out when I was on my mission, we were probably both on our missions. It, it didn't come out when I was on my missions before then, but we used it on the mission. We, we watched it a lot with people. Um, but there's one statement that his dad makes when his, he, Joseph, he reads James um, um, 1, 5, and um, his, I think before that, his dad says something in the effect of like, you know, I don't reckon that God wants to save only a few of his children. And I was just like, I don't know scripter, scripturally where that reference is or if that if there is a reference to that or anything like that. But I love that sentiment. I love that that thought that, you know, God really does want to us to, like he just like that that like you for your kids. You want them to learn to become autonomous and, and capable and powerful and good individuals and i think that god wants a lot for all of us and and we get we 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 get muddied up when we focus too much on the the details you know yeah yeah because i feel like faith is it also gives you that ability to to press forward and change your environment to make things better i mean there was so much of you know i kind of took it was a really good opportunity to do some automation training down in UVU. It would have been a two-year program. For some reason, I really wanted to do a four-year engineering program instead. And that became a six- or seven-year old seven year program. I, everybody goes through school at different speeds, but uh, I took the long route. And I remember even deep in the dark, like two second-year, third-year classes where it's really, they're like not even pretending they want to get rid of you. You know, they're like actively making your life measurable, you know, to make you the best you can be. And I still had that faith to push forward in it. You know, not saying that people don't make it through and people priorities change, but um, I had faith that, you know, the constant time away from my kids and the homework and, you know, all of this work that I was putting was meaningful. And I had faith that I would have, you know, this degree or certification for, you know, the effort that I put in. And because I have that, you know, I can do the same job I could have done before, except I understand deeper workings of it, and that makes me more marketable in this economy. And that makes it really nice. But, you know, I don't know. It's kind of, I feel like that kind of ties in with faith, because I feel like the principles of faith eventually will lead you, I mean, actually, they're probably just intertwined with it, so it immediately leads you to change and improve yourself and your environment. Um, I'm always reminded of that quote, you know, um, the world will change, will try to change the environment of a person, and to take, or, what is it, the world will take a man out of the slums, but Christ will take the slum out of the man, and Mm -hmm. then he will take himself out of the slums. Um, And I feel like faith is really a key driver in that. There's something core about faith in, like, even in planting crops and in, like, you you have a belief that something will happen. You have a belief that something's going to happen, and sometimes our faith is based like that's that's the interesting thing. Our faith is based off of experience. Um, in most cases, I think our faith is based off of like how we how we perceive the experiences we've had. Um, but you think of like science, right? Science and uh, science is the purpose of science. The way I understand it is to learn how to make 
uh, predictions that are accurate. Like that's mm -hmm. that's the best way that I can describe science. Um, and and this is referring to like um, Karl Popper being one of the the fathers of the scientific method. I mean, you can go back further, obviously, to like Aristotle and stuff like that. But Karl Popper in our in our modern day, he was he's a lot of at least at least according to the 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 way it was taught to me in the philosophy of science class I took um, at, up at USU. But um, Karl Popper is uh, he he. he he asserted that the purpose of science is to find truth. And that's a nice assertment, but it's also, um, he, he kind of developed this uh, theory of falsification where, um, I, I don't know if he developed it, but he refined it for sure. He was, um, th but that's why in science you always try to prove things false because you can't prove something that it is true um, because you don't know, for, for, for a scientific experiment, for example, you have the, um, your prediction, your hypothesis, your prediction, and you have, uh, is one side of your equation. You have an equation here, you have your prediction. This is what you think is going to happen. And then you have your experiment, and this is what you have. Like in, and that will include your controls. That will include, like, your, your, your control set. You'll include your sets that have variance. Um, and so you, you take all of it. And you have everything that you have that are key to that prediction. And then you also have unknown variables. And those unknowns are exactly that. You can't know the things that you don't know. And a very, very primitive and basic example of this it would be like, okay, a farmer who has chickens, right? Or has roosters. Um, his rooster crows every morning. He says, okay, the sun comes up because the rooster crows. And he's like, every time the sun is about to come up the rooster starts crowing and it's like okay there's 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 a repetition he he has some kind of evidence there's there's you can build a logical case based off of that um but you can't prove that the rooster is causing the sun to come up and um you have to take the rooster out and you can prove that the rooster doesn't by falsifying it but you can't prove that the rooster is causing it to come up and so it's like you can't prove that and the reason that you can't prove that is because your unknown variables they're always that they're unknown you don't know things that are affecting this experiment that you don't know about whether that's on the on the like very small micro scale whether that's magnetic some magnetic field whether that you don't know you don't know the things that you don't know and so because of that you can only disprove things and that's that's kind of where his his line of reasoning comes from I, yeah did i just go off i'm sorry yeah, I think that's relevant because i mean you tie that into faith and it's like <coughs> some of the biggest I have problems with faith is I think we get the wrong model in our heads, the wrong prediction. And then, you know, oh, great, it's, none of it's true, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's different things. So incorrect, incorrect model or incorrect learning of how you apply faith. But I also think that sometimes there's a lot of emotion that pushes bias. Like, you know, I really wanted a cheap apartment, you know, and <laughs> I had faith that it would work out or, I, well, you know, and I could have said, you know, I had faith that this cheap apartment would work out for me or whatever. And, and maybe it would have. But, you know, because I was willing to follow where I had or where I was, I feel like I was directed to, I ended up in a spot that I learned a lot. Um, that was far worth the money that I spent on it. Um, especially for, you know, how tight money is when you're starting out. But I see that with a lot of people too that that's a real struggle is I've got to learn exactly how faith works um, yeah that's, that's the thing that like even you have scriptural examples of it where you can give yourself revelation you think of Joseph Smith he asked if he could show if he could let Martin take the manuscript he asked the first time he got an answer no he asked the second time he got an answer no he asked the third time he got an answer do what you will like make the like you know and when we continue to ask, like, there are times that I've seen in my life where I've really wanted something, and I've asked, like, okay, I want this. Like, you, you pray, and you ask this, you pray, you ask this, you pray, and you ask this. And finally, I think that God will let us receive the, the answers that we want when we, when we put our will over His. I think that He does let us do that, because our agency is so important. Our agency is one of the, the most important things of this, of this life. And it's the, one of the very few things that we actually own ourselves, is the way that we choose. The way that we choose how to do things, the way that we choose our attitude. Um, 
the, the, the attitudes that we have. Those are our choices. And um, what, what I guess I'm, I'm getting at is when we, when t- tying in with that, our emotions can give us that wrong model of faith that can give us the 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 pre the the perception that oh i prayed really hard and i prayed and this is this is i I got i felt good and i got that feeling that this is right and so it has to be right and it's like well slow down like let i i it's 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 very um it's very it's kind of a heavy area because it's like you're you're making judgments on re- on revelation that people have, and I don't like to like I don't let people I, I like to let people um, experience their their lives themselves, experience their mm-hmm. own um, things themselves. But I know for myself, when I push really hard to ask God for something, and I it, over time I get it. Like, like I get the response that I was looking for. I don't say I get it. I get the response that I was looking for. That doesn't always work out good. That doesn't always work out good. And I think that's because I'm pushing so hard. And um, to flip that, uh, to flip that with, to contrast that with something else that that Joseph Smith said. He said, "There's one of the quotes where he says, weary the Lord until He blesses you.'" And it's like that's that's a direct. He's directly telling us to pray until God blesses you. And so it's like there, there's a conflicting concept there but i think that i think that the the way that i have um made peace with that i guess is yes obviously you want to pray until the lord blesses you you want to pray it it speaks in and um about praying over everything praying on your fields praying on your crops praying um, at night at mornings and you know you should always have a prayer in your heart but that prayer should never as christ christ taught it should always have that thy will be done it should always have that deference to god we should seek to receive god's counsel not seek to counsel god Mm -hmm. yeah that's kind of the million dollar question there (laughs) you know not to count counsel the lord or you know where is that where you don't i want to ask enough that he knows what i want but i don't want to ask enough that he gives me what i want because i ask what i want you know i want (laughs) you know i want to respect that I don't want to be so set on something that I wouldn't be willing to accept something better. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I like to read a lot of books in my spare time. And John Gottman kind of pointed out um, with relationships, uh, he focused on spouse relationships for like 40 years up in uh, Washington, I think. But uh, he mentioned one of the worst emotions is apathy, mm-hmm. um, where you, there's just nothing invested in the relationship. It's like, you know, you can usually overcome uh, anger or complete frustration, you know, in a, in a really heavy hit, heavy taxed relationship. But the real red flag that, like, things are going to go fall apart is just apathy, where somebody is just disengaged. So I could see where Joseph Smith would send that quote of, you know, weary him until you bless you. Because, I mean, even even anger or frustration or pleading would be better than no emotional connection at all or no no engagement yeah you know the apathy that's a good point i didn't i hadn't thought of that that's a good perspective yeah and i i think also with what you said you know sometimes what's good for me isn't necessarily good for everyone else you know like Mm -hmm. i'm kind of in that stage where i'm looking for a house and you know housing is going up and it's like yeah it sure would be nice if you know i could just pray to ask for you know the complete collapse of the housing market and houses become 50 percent off and (laughs) but that would really suck for my neighbor that just bought his house you know and so i don't know where it is you know where that is i think one of the best examples of faith that i've thought of is how the church was recognized formally in israel um i guess the israeli government when they had formed they formed a law that any religion that have you know can prove they had a presence before this date um, in Israel will formally recognize and it was pretty far back so the church was really having a struggle with it um, luckily we had sent missionaries there for a long time so we kind of we were, we were blessed but what really got the church there to be formally recognized was two missionaries had died of typhus or yellow fever and because they were 
they had died of these incredibly infectious diseases. Their bodies were not actually allowed to leave the state of Israel or that area. They had to be buried there. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that must have really sucked for those families. Oh. To not only lose your, your loved one on their mission, but to not even have their body to remember them. You know, and that family, it really sucks for them. You know, it really did not work out well for them. But it worked out well for the whole of the church being recognized. You know, and I, you know, <laughs> I feel like the Lord had a hand in that, you know, and I think that's the biggest, I think that's the thing that scares me the most about faith is that coming to peace with something that may not be in your okay. ultimate best interest. Yeah, right. As, as an individual or as your, your own personal goals. Yeah. That's, that's. The th- I, I guess the thing that also comes to my mind is that c- coming back to getting people as a society all going in the same direction that's that includes people not doing something for their best interest mm-hmm. uh, because because you have something higher that you're fighting for and and you think of like the the people who are like heroes a lot of times that's that comes at personal sacrifice mm-hmm. that comes at um, the expense of what might be in their best interest but because it was right they become heroes mm-hmm. and they, they become someone that is um, that you see in your your you you appreciate and you you we, we sing songs and tell stories and and I mean think of the the heroes of the revolution think of like George Washington and all of the all, like all, all throughout history the the, the different um, people that we that we hold up a lot of times the things that made those like Davy Crockett's one that I've been thinking about lately when he said he said um, Congress are you, you're familiar with Davy Crockett I assume where I he, watched we, all three of the Disney episodes <laughs> I don't remember no, <laughs> I, I don't I, I'm not I wouldn't say I'm a huge historian I think you, you'd probably know better than I do but um, at the end of his life he basically was telling Congress you need to go and support Texas because they're they're being invaded um or they basically are under attack. Uh, Santa Ana, I think, was was attacking um, some of the areas in Texas. Um, but and he was a congressman over back in one of the I, I forget which state, one of the um, eastern states, and, um, if I remember correctly. But he basically said to them, he's like, he's like, Congress, you can go to hell. I'm going to Texas. And he went to Texas and he fought at the Al- Alamo and he died at the Alamo, if I remember right. And that's like um, he the, the the whole remember the Alamo wasn't just for Davy Crockett. It was for the people. It was for the Alamo, and his, and um, they 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 were not willing to to stand down. They were they were fighting for their homes and fighting for from from what I remember. And 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 it's just like he he put himself his own um, life down because he it was the right thing to do, you know. Yeah. And I think that comes back to freedom and keeping those, keeping your life in check or keeping your life manageable because, you know, the person that's, you know, mortgaged to the hilt, you know, they don't have the freedom to do what they need to make those sacrifices. They don't have, you know, that sacrifices, <laughs> that threshold to sacrifice is a lot higher. You know, and I think that's part of being free is, you know, if you live within your means, you can you can do a lot of things you know i mean i could technically i could lose my job and we could be okay for six eight months barring any medical emergency because that's the quickest way you lose money but you know no health insurance but um you know and i think that's that's a good part of freedom it's it's actually given me a lot of peace of mind with my work you know knowing that if anything goes wrong or you know if you know with where i work there's no real ethical dilemmas but you know, you always hear of these different ethical dilemmas that pop up, you know, and the level of sacrifice is, you know, if I'm mortgaged to my eyeballs, you know, if I lose my job or get my hours cut, you know, I'm going to be sacrificing my house or any, you know, any and everything I own. Something has to be very disrupted for your family to be taken care of. Yeah. And, you know, right now with my, you know, the time I put into getting, a, you know, a marketable education, and staying out of debt and building up a savings, you know, that threshold is I lose my job, but, you know, chances are in six months I'll have another one. 
you know, and that's, that's a great place to be. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've heard, you know, circling back to uh, the Gulag Archipelago, I've heard that's a really good book to read when you're reading the Federalist Papers. Oh, really? Because the Federalist Papers are really like, really hard to read. They're not enjoyable reading for most people. Mm -hmm. But the Gulag Archipelago is more of the why. Like, why do we have this? And then the Fe Federalist Papers are more of the how. But I've heard that they're actually a really good companion thing. To I have not heard that. Yeah. I'll have to look that up. And I haven't read the Federalist Papers yet. I've, it's been on my one of those, like, I should read that sometime, and I just haven't yet. Yeah. That's the great thing about books is there's, there's so many around. to do. Yeah, right? It's, I'm going to run out of time before I run out of books. <laughs> yeah it's interesting to going back with that freedom though the and how our morals and the the commandments they're a lot of like that's that's another one where it's like as a kid it's like oh we believe in freedom and then was like oh why do you follow commandments that's not freedom that's you know you're being told what to do mm -hmm. and I've been amazed how consistently the commandments have kept me in a place where I am free. Like, the, there, there are things that I choose to do, but because I do them, it keeps me from being chained down by whether that's debt or addiction, whether that's um, addiction to, on so many different levels. Um, and, and it's just like... The, the commandments, the, the, there's, I, I love the, the, the analogy or, or uh, way of thinking of, of like sin or the, the bad mistakes that we make, thinking of that as like chains, you know, it's, it's, it, they're, they're, they're things that um, keep us, that control the way that we make choices. And ultimately commandments do that too you know and so it's mm -hmm. like well how do you differentiate between good good controlling chains and bad controlling chains and it's like well the commandments they're like this again that starting point they're the you know thou shalt not kill is like <laughs> okay that's that's the starting point yeah. but you know treat others kindly that's if you're treating others kindly then there's no way you're going to be killing people Unless you're defending yourself and stuff, and then I guess it's not... I don't know if that's... You, you know what I mean. But, like... It's... it's The the morality that we have... The thing that's so good about it... Is... It helps us to keep out of... Um, different forms of slavery. Yeah. And... I don't know, it's just there, there's there's something that, again, that you really have to have faith that, oh, this commandment is going to help you to follow it. And you can you can try to not follow it, and you can see if it... Sometimes you won't have bad effects immediately. Sometimes you will see, over time, the effects are devastating. Yeah. And so it's just like, I don't know. Uh, 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 back to that pole. Yeah, moving from a 15-year-old to a somewhat older person now, 15 with shipping and handling. Um, <laughs> I'm actually really grateful for those commandments because as a 15-year-old kid, I don't think I had really the sense to make up good guides for my life. Mm -hmm. and so I'm grateful for you know a wise heavenly Father that gave me these instructions. They're like. You know, if you disobey them, you're going to find out. You know, eventually you'll find out. Mm -hmm. But if you just take my word for it, like, you'll be off in a better place of life. You know, and as I've gotten older, you know, I've seen that with even my peers. You know, some of them are, they're quick. You know, um, stealing was a pretty pretty quick one for some of my friends. Um, well, acquaintances. But, you know, other, other ones are, you know, a little bit different. And, yeah, I'm, if I wasn't born with the family I had, you know, and I didn't have, because I grew up in a very rural um, farming community in Idaho, and they're great people, um, but they also expect you to live with honor, and there was a lot of great things about that, but if I wasn't given that situation to start with in life, 
those commandments would have been even more important for somebody who didn't have, you know, wiser adults or, you know, adults that genuinely wanted to help the youth around them. So, I mean, yeah, you can ignore them if you want. And one thing I've liked, I had a uh, bishop once give a talk where he, he had talked about a friend that they were fishing and he said, you know, one drink of beer isn't going to keep me out of heaven. And, you know, the bishop has thought about it and he kind of replied back to him. He's like, yeah, you know, let's let's pretend that, like, alcohol is not really the reason why he's doing it. Let's pretend that, like, yeah, that won't keep keep you out of heaven. But the idea of my will not thine that that in itself will keep you out of heaven faster than you know drinking a can of beer (laughs) yeah that's the thing is like i don't know i i've heard of like the commandments being like the greatest incentive program uh it's like you do this and you get this in heaven you do this and you get this in heaven and it's like that's if if that's a way that that you, you think about it and it works for you like that's there's nothing wrong with that but it's also, I, th- I think it's also um, incomplete because it's like, our, again, going back to your analogy with your son mowing the lawn. The purpose of this life is not for us to, to get a perfectly mowed lawn. Mm-hmm. The purpose of our life is to become autonomous and to become developed and full and complete and to grow up to be like our father, to grow mm-hmm. up to be, become something that is more than what we are right now. And it's like, that's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to quantify that without, without that, uh, without that perspective, I guess, because, because it's so easy to think like, okay, here's the commandments, do this and you'll get, you'll, you'll get, have your reward. And that's true. It is true. Like even, even, um, even even Christ teaches it of like even if you've done unto the least of these you've done unto me and like and your mansions are prepared in heaven and stuff like that and it's just like that it's true that's 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 one of the the, the beauties of of this life but it's also there's there, it's not the end it's not the, the the complete part of the story there's more to the story and 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 that's I think and I think that's that's exciting yeah yeah, and it's, you know, I'm always weary with the, or leery of the incentive program style. Because, like, if it works, that's great. And I've seen some people that, you know, and, and I mean, I think, it, I, I assume people, all people go through this. But I've seen some people that feel like, well, God didn't reach his side of the bargain that I think he agreed to. Mm-hmm. You know, therefore, I'm free to do whatever I want. And it's like, well, yeah. you were always free to do what you want. But, you know, some some choices have consequences, you know, or most of them do. And, you know, I think, you know, God didn't, God wouldn't promise that, you know, he, he never made any promise to me that my kid wouldn't have cancer, you know, and so far we're, he's cancer free, but that, you know, that could change at any point, you know, um, he did promise that my family would extend to eternity, you know, and that's, I think we need to also, you know, learn, I feel like for me personally, the hardest part with faith is learning to what extent that is, you know, because it's a bitter pill to swallow if you realized that you thought you made a different, you know, a yeah. different agreement. You you, know. you, you, you're, again, it's the, you, you have, you're coming in with the wrong perspective and it's frustrating. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it, it's hard. And yeah, it's, it's, you're not in the place that you want to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, Going to back to like commandments or blessings, you know, I was actually talking with my wife, um, and we were just going through because we're getting ready for our third child at this point, and we were just going back to our first child when we had him. We'd been married for, you know, a little over a year, and um, we had him, and they put him in our arms, and then they left, you know, and every, both sides of our family came and visited for a couple of days, and then they left, and I remember as my parents were leaving, it was like, oh, you're leaving me with this small child like you know you know this small <laughs> life form that yeah literally cannot live for more than six hours without your help you know and if we're just going to put them in the arms of a 23 year old you know like <laughs> and shut the door you know and it was really Good luck. <laughs> yeah it was incredibly overwhelming and i was grateful that um it, those commandments of being 
married and sealed to a, a partner, I was like, well, it's not just me and this baby. Like, we've cut, we can tag team, you know. <laughs> and that was a huge blessing because I can't imagine, you know, raising one child by myself. You know, I props right. to anybody who does that, you know. But, you know, that's that was a blessing for me. And now with the third child, it's like, he'll be okay, you know. He's a boy, so he'll... He can take some hard knocks, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I've only had boys to this point, so I don't even know what it's like to raise a girl. But <laughs> they're fun too. Is that a fish? I don't know. Yeah. It couldn't have been a fish. Sounds like a big one. Uh, maybe it was. I don't know. Um. This has been really good. Is there anything else you got on your mind, or? No, oh, I think I'm just floating through it it's I feel like we've kind of just nip, talked about the nebulous part but yeah no I think that's that's about all I got well I guess um, one of the things one of the things that I one of the reasons why I decided to talk a little bit more on um, about the spiritual side of things today is because I really do believe that um, the problems that we're facing as a, as a society come down to our shared morality the way that we um, allow ourselves and those around us to be immoral and and it's not like you can stop it but you also you also can do everything you can to to fight for good and for for what's right um, and not not in a bad or malicious way but in a way that's that's brings everybody better makes everybody better it brings everybody um, closer to to God and it brings everybody more freedom and that's kind of that's the, that was that's I, I, I don't know that's that's what I was thinking so hopefully hopefully you enjoyed it again this is episode 24 of Elders Rising anything else before we go no I think that's it good well, luck thank you for watching <laughs>